this is what we do, like game on. I was the knuckle dragon jock grunt. It extended beyond just me as a Green Beret or as a soldier. I was learning how to be a better man. Hard work, sacrifice, discipline, dedication. Like these tenets are drilled into your brain literally from day one. That's such a badass formula. And one of the Afghan local police guys jumped up on the back of this Ford Ranger and just had it open and fire into the group. We can get into the nitty gritty, but I mean, I literally taught that guy how to use the gun he shot me and my friends with. I absolutely 100% should have died that day. I always want to start conversations when I ever I'm connecting with someone who is in active duty. It seems like there's something about the training or about the military or about the way that you are brought up where us civilians are just so all over the place with everything. We give up on everything. We face all these challenges and we fall apart. And yet you guys are able to just push through and get done. Yeah, there's certainly a lot that goes into that, that answer and that question. It's a good one, Mark, though. I just say uh, two things. One, we have a variety of different methodologies in which we operationalize our success. The way we go about our planning process from the macro to the micro, the macro being, you know, large scale campaign planning, like massive military strategy broken down all the way to the more of a micro. Those of us that are on the ground that are saying, okay, I got to go from where I am now to that building because there's a bad guy inside. But the planning essentially is the same thing. You're just going from really, really big to much smaller. And we're just trained over countless hundreds and thousands of hours of repetition on how to go through that planning process. Um, <laughs> and I, I've been fortunate to be able to go to some pretty advanced schools and some schools that are designed for much senior military members at a much lower rank, and then use that knowledge and apply that to myself as an individual, as a civilian, yeah. just as, as Nick Lavery, just the guy that exists. So the way that we go about operationalizing our missions is done very deliberately based off of hundreds of years of doing military type operations. And then, you know, kind of just more on the individual level, you know, from the day you show up to basic training or boot camp or whatever branch you go into, whatever that indoctrination process is, you know, hard work, sacrifice, discipline, dedication, like these tenets are drilled into your brain literally from day one and they just are continuously refined. So we've got, you know, our planning methodologies that we leverage, but then on the individual level, our character and what makes us successful. And you combine those things and a bunch of other stuff in between, and, and you can be pretty successful. Even within the military, like for yourself, for example, are you pretty operationally focused, pretty analytical, like it comes naturally to you? Or, or are there people who have strengths and weaknesses, even in that area? And it's like, I guess what I'm asking is, is it that those strengths are accentuated? or even the worst person at planning, the worst person at carrying out step-by-step -step instructions just gets it so drilled into them that it becomes second nature. Yeah, I'd say it's like anything else, man. You know, certain people certainly have some talents with this type of stuff, the analytical thought process and just a genuine interest in analysis and examining and fine tuning and looking at what problems are and just being genuinely interested in diving into the details and the process behind that. Yeah. But it's mostly done through pure force blunt trauma <laughs> just, and just continuous <laughs> repetitions, reps, man. Just yeah. reps and reps and reps. Like I noticed in your book in the breakdown, so your book, Objective Secured, and this is why we started by talking about plans and objectives. We're going to get a bit into your backstory, but the book that came out last year, even in your breakdown on Amazon, it says author's intent, you know, the mission reader will absorb the principles and vignettes of objective secure. You go into the key tasks, you're going to read, you're going to ruminate, you're going to implement your end state. And so for me, as someone who's a bit of a marketer, as an entrepreneur and a creative, I go, oh, that's such a badass formula. That's such a great marketing tactic. Mm -hmm. But I have to imagine that you weren't just trying to be cool. Like this is the foundational way that you approach everything that you do coming from the military, right? 100% man. And and that intent, you know, so in, in the military, it's really referred to as the commander's intent. And both of those words have importance, but particularly the word intent. And it's a word that is used quite often. We in the military have a very specific definition of what goes within intent. 
right? Like you could say like, what's your intent? It's like, well, why are you doing what you're doing? Like, what are you trying to do? That's my intent. For us, intent is a very specific list or ingredients that go within that to create an intent. And that is just the way at this point, my brain functions. When I think of intent, it's deliberately put in within just about every single task I do. And it's just a way for me to visually recognize and appreciate the value of this particular thing because it's linked to this objective and to this mission. And it's just, it's broken down in just a series of events over time and space to lead to what ultimately that I'm trying to do. So it helps me, particularly in the times that I really don't want to do something, things are really, really hard. It's like, mm-hmm. no, I know what my intent is. And one is the what you just kind of outlined, you got your expanded purpose. So how is this task correlated to the higher, the bigger picture? How does this relate to the bigger picture? So for us on the ground, tactically, yeah, I may go into this building to kick down a door to go find a bad guy, but how is that nested, which is the key word, within our higher echelons of leadership, their intent? So how is this one small task linked to the bigger picture? Key tasks are things that absolutely have to happen in order to reach mission success. And then end state, what do things look like once you've completed this mission, what does the environment look like? What do you look like? What does it look like for you professionally? You could use this tool a variety of different ways. So for one, I wanted to kick off the objective secure with that very clearly defined intent to give readers an idea of what it is they were embarking on. But also for me, as I was writing it, I used that exact little model just to keep myself straight to do the really difficult work that is writing a book. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So, okay. You've been in battle. You've had to recover from a life changing injury. And we're going to get into that story. And uh, you've written a book. Which one was the hardest? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> I say that really, with jest. I have to imagine recovery has been the hardest, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you didn't put this on there because the true answer is none of those comp- are anywhere close to the challenge of being a father and being a husband. like Really? That's probably my most, being a father in particular, is probably the most difficult job I've taken on, but also the most rewarding. Out of the ones you just listed, certainly getting back into the fight, you know, literally as a yeah. one-legged guy was more challenging than writing a book. Okay, let's let's get into that. So 9-11 happens. You've already decided that you want to have a military career as a young guy. I think we're about the same age. I was... I'm Canadian. So we had five years of high school. So Mm. I was in my fifth year of high school when September 11th happened. And I remember standing there watching the TVs. I remember the towers falling. I remember the aftershock for anyone who's younger. My kids are in their teens now. And they just don't understand how life altering September 11th was. And so you decide you want to get into the military. You decide you want to become a total badass and, and not just enter at, at the beginning of a military career. You're like, I want to be on the upper echelon of this kind of stuff. Talk us through a real quick, your career, how you got into the military, and then ultimately what happened. Yeah. I mean, you said a 9-11 was certainly the catalyst for me. And you know, to be clear, Mark, I didn't join with even the remote idea of this becoming a career for me or a profession or a lifestyle. This was going to be a short-term stint. I was going to come in. I was going to kick some ass. I was going to get some payback. I was going to serve my country, do the minimum contract necessary to do that at the very tip of the fight, and then get out and figure out what I wanted to do with my life when I grew up. That was really my game plan. Uh, My problem with that was I fell in love with this industry. And it really wasn't until I was in Afghanistan doing it that I just said, there's no way I could do anything else and feel this fulfilled. What is it about it? Because to me, I remember sitting at a dinner a few days after September 11th. So I'm uh, how am I? I'm 18, I think. And I'm sitting at a dinner and I remember with my in-laws who I wasn't married to my wife at the time, they had people over and I said, I think we're going to go to war. And, you know, I'm an 18 year old guy at the time. And I remember saying, I think I would sign up for this type of thing. And the people older than me all said, you don't know what you're talking about, Mark. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know at all. And then since then, I've never served. I don't have anyone in my family who has served. It just does not seem like the type of thing that I would fall in love with. 
<laughs> what hmm. is it about service and being over there and being in the action that you fell in love with? I'll point out a couple of things. One is, especially in special operations, uh, so for an SF team, otherwise known as an ODA, it's, it's 12 guys. So to be in that type of extremely complex, obviously dangerous environment where we are asked to solve really difficult problems that almost extend beyond what's practical for 12 individuals to do themselves. <laughs> to be in that type of space, working that closely on challenges that are seem unobtainable, but then finding solutions is incredibly rewarding. It's like, wow, mm. I didn't even think that I was capable of this. And certainly not me and you know, 11 of my buddies were able to do something to, of this scale. So the, the job itself was very fulfilling. And then also connected to my teammates, just the amount I was learning from these guys, all of which were much more senior than I was. I was the new kid on the team, the new, young, cherry, don't know anything guy. And I'm surrounded by these warriors, many of which had been to Afghanistan four or five times prior in combat, doing all the things. I was learning so much from these guys every single day. It was like drinking out of a fire hose. I mean, I may have been able to obtain 10% totally, but it, it extended beyond just me as a Green Beret or as a soldier. I was learning from them on how to be a better man, how to be a better person. So I just, you know, I woke up one day and said, I don't think I'm going to find something even remotely close that's going to fill this kind of void. And I now feel like this is what I was put on this earth to do. It was the first time I had any sort of remote connection with a purpose, with an actual meaning, with being a part of something bigger than myself. So it was right there. And then I, it was only about halfway through that deployment, I still had multiple years left on my contract. And I re-enlisted for another maximum time of like six years beyond that. And it was like, okay, this is no longer a job for me. This is a profession and a lifestyle. Hmm. I don't even know what to say to that. It just seems so foreign, but I can understand it. I can understand the achievement. I can understand the camaraderie. I can understand the challenge and wanting to overcome that, wanting to be good. So what happened? What happened uh, next? I suppose. I mean, to fast forward through time a little bit, I was ultimately back in 2012. I was in my third time back in Afghanistan, and I was wounded three times on three separate occasions on the same deployment. So we were there for six months. The first time, I took some grenade shrapnel to the back of my shoulder. Really, wasn't that big of a deal. I was out of the fight for maybe four or five, six days. And then I was just right back to work. And about six weeks after that was when I was moved for the second time. I got shot in the face by an AK-47, which sounds a lot worse than it was. It really just grazed me. I got really, really lucky, ripped my face open. It looked nasty. It bled a lot, but it, you know, literally a flesh wound as we kind of stereotypically call it. And then Towards the very back end of that the same deployment, we only had a couple of weeks left before we were coming home was when I was wounded for the third time. And this one was obviously much more severe. We can certainly get into the nitty gritty, but you know, it was an insider attack, meaning a guy that we had been working alongside of a member of the Afghan National Police Force opened fire on me and my team with a truck mounted belt fed machine gun from about 20, 25 feet away. And most of the damage to me was to my right leg. It took about four or five rounds, shattered my femur, severed my femoral artery. I ultimately treated myself until some of my teammates got to me. They were able to provide a little extra aid. But really, man, for all intents and purposes, I absolutely 100% should have died that day. And obviously I didn't because I'm here talking to you. And, you know, the journey continues from there. I spent a year at Walter Reed. And then once I got back to my unit, was when my next major street fight began. And that was with the army who was really trying to have me medically retired. And I had to just dig in and refuse to accept that and eventually work myself back to where I'm supposed to be. Whew, there's a lot to unpack there. So how is it that you can be hit with grenade shrapnel and you know, you're out for a few days, but that still must've been scary as hell. You get shot but a flesh wound, you say, still must be scary as hell. I mean, 
is this just another day at the office because there was just so much happening? Or is each one of these little things kind of ticking away and adding another tick of like doubt, another tick of fear, another tick of worry? Like, what's this doing to your mindset? What's this doing to your head? Yeah, it's going to sound like some, you know, bravado, machismo bullshit, um, which is okay. The truth is we were dropped off into a hornet's nest, me and my teammates. We knew where we were going into. We knew it was going to be a knockdown street fight every day. And it's exactly where we wanted to be. And we got exactly what we asked for. So what's important to keep in mind is that even though I suffered these two injuries prior to the one that really changed the trajectory of my life... (laughs) in context to the environment we were living in and in context with what we were doing every single day, it was very marginalized because of the severity of what was going on around us. I had friends and teammates that were being much more severely wounded than myself. I had friends and teammates that were being killed. We were just engrossed in combat. And it's really amazing, man, what the human mind and body can become conditioned to with enough reps and with enough time of any particular environment or any particular task. You know, the first time I jumped out of a plane, it's like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm a land walking mammal. This is the most unnatural thing I could do, but like crazy, right? You do it 250 times and yeah, your heart rate speeds up a little bit. You get that little worry. There's some you know, little anxiety, but it's not nearly the same as it was the first time because you've just done it so many times. <laughs> Being in combat is is just like that, or really just like anything else. And that's the environment that we lived in. So the context in which these things happened to me is a huge aspect of why I was able to say, okay, man, no big deal. Like this is another day at the office because this is what I signed up for. This is what we do. Yeah. This is why you're here. Yeah. Suck it up, get yourself treated, whatever that takes, and then get back to work. Is there a little bit of... I'm a- total badass and each time that you get a little scar it's like it's almost like another notch in the belt of pride of like you can't stop me like can you turn these things into like into fuel as well without getting too unhealthy about it i was able to do that i think it's certainly a very slippery slope that you're on at that point it'd be tough because in order for us to do the things that we need to do as green berets as special operations personnel. We have to operate with a extremely high degree of confidence. That's a key word, confidence. If you're going to drop me and 10 of my friends off, we're going to slide down ropes onto a rooftop that we've never been before ever in the middle of the night. And we're going to start kicking down doors, knowing people on the other side with guns. In order to even come remotely close to being able to do that, you have to go into it knowing Me and my boys are the baddest people in this valley. This is what we do, like game on. Like you have to have that to go do that. Much like football players or any athletes that enter into that type of arena where injury is almost probable. Like to be able to go do that, you have to be operating at a really high degree of confidence. And for me, when I was wounded those two times, it did enable that quite a bit. It was like, okay, yeah, yeah, like this is what I do. Bring it on. Like good luck taking me down. You know, that kind of hype, internal hype that was fueling that confidence. The reason why I say it can get slippery is because it could easily enter into this realm of cockiness or arrogance. Mm. And like the separation between being highly confident and arrogant, I think is probably razor thin. And if you end up in that place of arrogance or this unrealistic superiority complex, then you can forget the fact that you're a human being and there are limitations in which what the body is capable of. So it's a difficult ridge to try to walk. Looking back in retrospect, I feel like, you know, I came pretty close to staying on that razor's edge. Yeah. And the reason I say it is I think most of us are afraid of it. And, you know, my wife is always... I like to do little challenges just to prove that I'm a badass because frankly, most of the time I don't feel like a badass. Mm. Most of the time I feel lazy and weak and scared and afraid and all of those things. And when I tell Mm. that to people, either they do two things. They go, Mark, we all feel this way, Mm. but no one talks about it. Or people look at me and go, really? And they're a little bit surprised. Mm. So there's only so many cold plunges you can do and runs you can do and pushing yourself. But often 
when I get hurt or I'm really challenging myself, I try to turn it into, it's like if you're trying to go through a cut, you can either just be hungry all the time or you can say, Ooh, this hunger, this hunger means yes. it's worth it. Who else, yes. who else is going to do this? Who else is capable of, of running a 5k dehydrated on a cut? Cause you're getting ready for photos or whatever it is, right? Like you yeah. can just like, you can like feed it. And because it's not natural to me, I love it. I think more of us should do this. I'm almost not even worried about going too far off the deep end with it because I think naturally my confidence and our self-doubt is so high. Our confidence is so low. We need more of it. We're not built to be these arrogant machines. Mm. And so I think it's interesting that there's a fine line, but I would prescribe that more of us need it. I don't know what Mm. you think of that. Yeah, I would agree, man. You know, also keep in mind, I would agree with what you just said. I think that's absolutely brilliant. In my world, we live in the world of extremely hyper type A, hyper competitive (laughs) individuals, right? Which is part of what makes us great. It's also part of what opens up a vulnerability in a lot of different ways. So again, I'm a product of my environment to a large degree. And my experience has shown me that most operate with an extremely high degree of confidence and many do go kind of past that point to the realm of cocky and arrogance. And if you walked up to any single person on the planet for the most part and said, Hey, would it shock you to hear that Navy SEALs are cocky? The answer would probably be like, (laughs) no, like, of course that wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise you. Right. I'm talking some shit about my Navy squid brothers, but you know, it's part of what makes us great, right? You can be a seal. You can be a ranger. You can be anyone in the military. You can be anyone in law enforcement, fire, emergency services. I would rather have you be confident on my side than not confident. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's, so it's I give you guys permission. Yeah. <laughs> please, please you have to be have confident it. and arrogant. <laughs> yeah, you do have to have. But I would say generally outside of this tiny, tiny world that I live in, man, which is super small, you know, demographic, um, I would challenge people to lean into that a bit. And like you said, man, find yourself at these points of doubt and discomfort and struggle. Lean into that. I realize how hot it is, man. And this is by no means is this easy. But there's absolutely something to be gained by if you can flip that and to see it as an opportunity to grow and get stronger and more capable and more resilient and et cetera, that can become a very dangerous aspect of us. And I see that in a good way where we can really weaponize who we are. Yeah. If you can, if it's not too sensitive and by all means, please don't answer this if it is, but you know, I had Jason Redman on the podcast. I'm not mm. sure if you're familiar with him. He's oh, yeah. a great author of a great book. And I asked a very similar question because in those moments, so you have someone who's supposed to be on your side turn on you. They shoot you guys up. In those moments of realization that you are hurt, that you are injured, you know, things are going to look bad. Things are going to get scary. What's going through your head? In those exact moments for me, um, it was, this is where I die. I knew that with 100% certainty, with 100% certainty. There was no question about it. I knew my femoral artery was cut. I knew that because of that, I might have eight or so minutes to live. I knew this is where it would end. And for me, the emotional roller coaster that I went on is one that is still extremely vivid to me to this day. It began with frustration because this was at the hands of someone that we had been working with, right? So that sense of betrayal, I mean, I literally taught that guy how to use the gun he shot me and my friends with. So really frustrated. And out of all the gunfights and explosions and all the things, man, like this was how I was going to go out. That was really frustrating. That passed pretty quick. And then I felt a pretty strong wave of guilt about what my family and loved ones would experience. You know, the vision of some general handing my mother a folded flag at Arlington. I felt guilty for what they were going to go through. But then there was this enormous wave of content that came over me that was triggered by that thought of my family. As I know now that they know that this is what I do. And if I'm going to die, it's going to be in combat because that's a warrior's death. That's more than a poetic quote to me. That's a philosophy that I live by. And they know that about me truly have adopted the comeback with your shield or on it mindset. So I knew that that would provide at least a little bit of relief to them. 
And then I just kind of stayed on that course and found myself in a place of, you know, yeah, this is the way that I go out. It's surrounded by my brothers in combat. There's no other place I'd rather be right now than alongside them. And I'm okay with that. And so did you black out? You said you just started self-administering some help. Did you, did you lose consciousness? Did you find yourself waking up and suddenly you're still here? So uh, once I applied some interventions, uh, I was in and out of consciousness for what ended up being almost an hour and a half, about 90 minutes until the first medevac helicopter could, could land to come pick us up because this guy opened fire on us, but this was a pre-coordinated attack. So as soon as he did that, all of these guys that had us basically surrounded all began lobbing machine gun and rockets into our compound. So it took my teammates and the rest of the guys that were there with us about an hour and a half to get the situation on the ground under control enough to where they could start landing medevac helicopters to start pulling us out. So 90 minutes had gone by and I was in and out of consciousness during this time. So I got a little like flashes of memories, but one that I remember extremely clear is when they were loading me onto the Blackhawk and one of my teammates grabs me by my face and he looks me in the eye and he's telling me he loves me. And he's saying his last goodbyes to me. And I know that. And although I, my initial thought was to say something nice back to him, I was like, wait a minute, dude. Like, how am I still here? I don't know how much time had gone by, but I could tell by the position of the sun that it had been a decent amount of time. And I'm going, wait a minute. I definitely should have been dead by now. And that was my first surge of energy that came coursing through my body. And it was like, wait a minute, maybe you can actually battle through this. Maybe this isn't the end of the game for you. And in that exact moment, they're packaging me up to get airlifted off. I went into combat mode, right? A place that I am extremely familiar with and I'm extremely comfortable within. I deliberately leaned into that. And although I wasn't shooting a rifle and although I couldn't see my enemy, I was now in a fight and I was about to throw some fucking punches, bro. <laughs> and that time in between, was it luck? Was it a miracle? Is it just one of those statistic things that you kind of just worked out or like what happened in the gap between you sure you had eight minutes left and you going, Oh fuck. No, I'm going to fight for the last possible second. <laughs> There's a few things in play. One is I was trained very well medically. So the interventions I applied were two tourniquets I put on myself. A teammate eventually put a third one on me. Bleeding still didn't stop. So I grabbed some gauze out of my kit. I loosened up one of the tourniquets. I balled this gauze up into what we call a power ball, rammed it up into my thigh, <laughs> trying to feel for the pulse of the femoral artery to get direct pressure on it. Uh, went for it wrenched down, fed the rest of the gauze inside the wound to pack it, and then resecure the tourniquet back on top of that. The doctors who eventually saw me, who I've had a chance to talk with, you know, years and years later, told me, dude, you absolutely nailed your femoral artery. And that is, you know, it's great training. It's great training, but it's also some luck, right? This Because I, I couldn't really feel anything. You know, when you're losing that much blood, your blood shunts inward to protect your organs as long as possible. So I have no dexterity. I couldn't feel anything. I'm on the verge of blacking out. I just got really, really lucky. So great training, certainly some luck, but it's also really difficult, man, to not or to ignore the likelihood of some divine intervention. And like now we enter into the realm of spirituality and religion. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I grew up Irish Catholic, I really was not a great practicing Catholic, but I've had a decent sense of my spirituality from a very young age. It's tough to look at the math here, the statistics behind this. And I've talked to med students and trauma surgeons, including docs that treated me on the ground that day. And they're, through everyone's account and everyone's understanding of modern medicine, if you present this case to a group of med students or on a board panel of trauma surgeons, the likelihood of my survival is as close to zero as it gets, right? We don't live in a world of certainties, obviously, but you're talking point zero 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 repeating. And then there's a one like somewhere down the line, because not only 
did I lose that much blood that I treated myself? I was on the battlefield for an hour and a half before I got in front of a doctor. Once I did get in front of a doctor, I was administered a blood transfusion with an incompatible blood type, which Ooh. just made what was already a catastrophe just that much worse. So when you factor that in, there's no way that I'm supposed to be alive. So, you know, the definition of a miracle is something that is essentially impossible without divine intervention. I just choose to believe that also is at play. So I'd say training, luck, and someone looking out for me. That's remarkable. I know that part of the big reason why you wrote your book, you know, Objective Secured, is that people kept asking you the same questions over again. One, Mm. what got you through your recovery when you lost your limb? And two, why the hell would you go back into service? (laughs) How? Like, how is it? You you said that the army was doing everything or was doing everything possible to try and retire you from, you know, on medical leave. You're still active. Mm -hmm. How did you get through that? How did you develop the grit and the determination and the mental toughness to be able to say, no, this is something I'm committed to and I'm going to do? Yeah, it's multi-layered, man. You know, the why is is somewhat simple. I mean, one, I'm extremely stubborn. I'm hyper-competitive. The idea of anyone (laughs) dictating my future but me just was unacceptable. And that's kind of just on the superficial peripheral level. You know, the why obviously goes a lot deeper. I kind of touched on it. Like, this is my purpose in life. This is why I'm here. People struggle with the, you know, what is your why? I'm fortunate to be one of them in the minority that knows what that is. So when I'm in the hospital and I'm in the intensive care unit and I'm still going through countless surgeries and fighting for my life, no point did I need to just figure out what I was going to do, which is a huge challenge for a lot of people. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Particularly on the offset of some kind of trauma or some kind of life altering experience. For me, the what was already identified because this is what I do. This is who I am. This is why I'm on this planet. So I could just immediately bypass the answer to that question, which is very important because now all roads led to the how. I know what I'm going to do. This is really interesting though, because so many of us struggle with transition because we go, if I am not, right, if I'm not married anymore, who am I? If I'm Mm. not an executive anymore, what am I? If I'm not soldier anymore, then who am I? And so when these traumatic life events happen, when these surprises happen, when changes happen, most of the time we don't go, this is who I am. How do I keep doing it? We go, I can't, I've lost it. I can't Mm. do it. And we spend so much time trying to figure it out, mostly because of the lost identity, the lost purpose, the lost... I'm so surprised you never even got lost along that way. You just were like, nope, not even an option to start questioning that. Yeah. It's actually a part of me that kind of a, I don't know, a sick and twisted or kind of weird way, almost wished I, I experienced that a little bit more. So I'd have a higher degree of empathy with those that, that, that struggle with that exact thing. <laughs> you know, for one, I never struggled with figuring out what I'm going to do. And then two, I think because of that, I really didn't go down this dark, negative, pessimistic road. I was able to remain relatively positive most of the time. Don't confuse that with there were certain countless times of anger and frustration and doubt and, you know, the roller coaster ride. But, you know, trauma can oftentimes psychologically drive people down into a really negative dock and scary and sometimes catastrophic space. I avoided that. And I think it's because I had such a deep connection with what my mission was from the very, very beginning. Just chose not to accept it. You just it's interesting because I think the lesson here is it's tempting And our first path for most of us would be to immediately abandon everything we were and everything we had and say, we have to somehow become something new. And you just chose not to accept it. You were just like, I'm not changing these things. And if we can, when we face these setbacks or challenges, just choose not to accept them, we can jump straight to how do we get back or how do we focus on what's next, maybe even a little bit quicker. I'm wondering Mm -hmm. if we don't get bogged down so much in all of the questioning everything, if we just choose not to accept it. Well, here's a great point. It's not a counter to that, but it's important is that I had to recreate the ways in which I do a lot of the things that I need to do to do what I do. So they're the, the, from the macro and the mission, like this is what's going to happen. But in order to do that, one, I have to become very honest and raw with my current operational environment. 
you are never, ever going to be as physically dominating as you were with two legs. That's a tough pill to swallow when you grow up a college athlete, MMA fighter, jiu-jitsu practitioner, two-legged ass kicking green beret, right? And who I was, my identity was probably 80% brawn, 20% brain. Like that was me. I was the knuckle dragging jock grunt. I had to modify that recognition of, of who I am and how I do what I do. I had to. That was difficult. So even though I was going to get back to doing what I do, my strengths and my weaknesses and what I needed to work on and the mechanisms that I would use, the actual tools and skills that I would have to build were going to be different. So people say, you know, you had to like redefine yourself. And I said, I really didn't need to redefine myself. I had to modify myself. And that took a huge amount of humility to be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, dude, you're not going to be the same guy you were, but that doesn't mean you can't do what you know you're put on this earth to do. So the how very much becomes just this equation in which I know I need to equal X at the end of this. What I did in the past was, you know, one plus two plus three plus four equals X. Well, now like three, five, and seven have to change, but there is still a way that this equation can equal X. You just have to figure out what variables need to change. And that's done through, you know, strategy and discipline and execution and all the kind of typical stuff. But just because you brought this up, man, I think it's great is there is a way to get to it. It may be foreign to you. It will almost certainly be different, but are you willing to go on that journey to find out what modifications need to be made to reach the same end state as which you once previously had? And how did you not either give up along the way? And I'd love to get specific. I mean, I would love for you to say, you know, okay, here was the challenge that I had to face. I knew that I had to adjust this one thing for this reason. Because your goal was to get back into service. Your goal was to walk again. Like, what was it? And how did you attack this to be able to put that together? So the goal was to get back onto an SF team, back into combat. Staying in the Army, unacceptable. Staying as an active duty Green Beret, also unacceptable. I was going back to the detachment to go back into Afghanistan or Iraq or all the places that we go to go back and getting a gunfights. Because that's and what I do. On your side, when so when you list out, I need to get back to the station that I had, to the position I had, at the level I had, operating mm-hmm. people I was capable of operating with. Anything else is unacceptable. Anything else is a failure. Mm-hmm. Who's on your side? Are, are doctors on your side? Are physios on your side? Are, is your leadership on your side? Or are you kind of <laughs> army <laughs> of one? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. On the exterior, I had no pun intended an army on my side. And okay. you know these people supported me in just tremendous ways. Family, friends, teammates, leadership, doctors, pros- prostatists, an arsenal of humans that were all supportive. Deep down, and most of which, this is something I learned you know, years later, no one actually thought that what I had set my sights on was possible. And it hadn't happened before. So that's understandable. Like there had never been an above the knee amputee to go back to a special forces ODA to go back into combat. That had never happened before. So they're in a really difficult position because they want to be supportive and remain positive and, you know, be an asset. And I'm like, I'm going back to the team. And they're like, awesome, man, let's do it. Let's go in the gym. Let's go to this physical therapy appointment. Let's do like whatever you got next. This comes back to that fine line of arrogance and confidence that we spoke about, right? You had confidence in your ability and everyone else is going... I don't want to set this guy up for disaster because man, is it going to be more disappointing later when he realizes that he's not capable of doing it, right? And it's from a place of love, right? Like these people love me and they don't want to see me go through that epic defeat and then have to be there to pick up the pieces. I was able to pick up on that. So I had to become extremely comfortable in solitude. And I mean Mm -hmm. that both literally and figuratively, like literally You know, it's the cliche early morning, late nights, right? Like the work you do when no one's around and no one's caring. There's that. But there's also the figurative comfort within solitude, meaning that even though I have seven or 12 or 100 people physically with me, no one is on the same page as me. This is my belief. And I own this 1000%. And quite frankly, 
I don't give a shit if no one else believes it with me. That's fine. It's like if someone has a really strong connection relationship to God, and we keep going down this biblical road for a second, if you believe in God, and that's a huge pot. If every single other human being on the planet, poof, overnight was an atheist, would that change your belief in your God? I would argue for most, the answer would be no. It would be like, I don't care. Like, you mm-hmm. guys believe what you want. I know what I believe, and that is unwavering to me. I was able to accept the support that was provided me by hundreds of people and really be completely unmoved if and when I was able to either feel or they were outright telling me, hey, man, like expectation management, right? That's like a cliche phrase. Expectation management, like maybe we don't set our sights on that right now. And I'd be like, you know what, man? I love you. I know where this is coming from. It's all good. But I know what I believe in and I'm moving forward regardless. You just reminded me of, you know, the Andy Minio song, You Can't Stop Me? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a lyric there where it's like, they try to shut us down and it ain't going to slide. The only mm. thing I fear is God and he's on my side. That's the confidence of God because he's got me. That just reminds me of, of what you're saying there. So how do you break down an attack using this operational mindset, mm. using this like, I'm going to make shit happen, using this confidence, using this hard work, using this dedication? How long did it take for you to be able to recover to the point where you're from injury to boots in the dust, which has got to be a great feeling, just walk back onto the front, right? Yeah, I did get that, you know, that glorified moment that I had envisioned, you know, countless times of getting off that plane back in Afghanistan, you know, arms in the air saying, you should have killed me when you had the chance because now I'm back, <laughs> right? So I did, I did get that moment. Uh-huh. Flash the bang, you know, the entire process from the time I was wounded to the time I was back in Afghanistan was right around two years, which is still- which is a damn on. long time, man. It's a damn long time. Well, for the in the amputee recovery game, and every person's different, every circumstance is different. 24 months is you still have a lot to learn. And I did as well. And I realized that once I got back into that environment, into that arena, I was like, holy shit, there's a lot of things that I still haven't figured out yet. So the learning curve was quite steep. And I just attacked that like I did anything else. You know, it was just identify where the gap is and through some trial and error and some analysis and then just, you know, repetition. So it was a lot of the same things, but it was, you know, it was two years. And did the two years drag by? Was it, was it painfully slow? No, it actually went by pretty fast. I was because during that time, my administrative fight with the army that took eight months. I was working as an instructor teaching combatives, which is a military for hand to hand combat. And I was just living this extreme lifestyle. And actually, in the book and objective secure, I outlined what a typical day looked like for me. And it was broken down to the minute. So While I knew what my overall desired end state was, and I had my lines of effort, and I had this like strategy, most of my focus was on like the five meter target in front of me, all the way down to do laundry right now and then begin preparing your dinner in 12 minutes from now. Like that's the way that I lived. So by harnessing my focus into these like micro goals, it didn't really allow for it to seem like this never ending process, this never ending journey, because I went into it unknowing how long it would take, but this is the way that I'm going to go about achieving it. And every single task is put here on purpose. So I can't go through the motions with anything that's in here. Everything that's here is here on purpose. Everything here is deliberately built within this. They're all super important. So whether it was doing laundry, meal prepping, going into the gym for my third workout, doing this one particular rep of the back squat, like this one technique in jujitsu, every single thing was meticulously put there. So that was where my focus was. So it didn't really seem like it was this long journey that I was trying to get to the end of. Like I was trying to see at the end of a bridge that I couldn't mm. see across. And it mm. was so daunting because the goal was so big that it became overwhelming to me. I really didn't experience that too often because I was so micro focused day to day to day to day. Hmm. The reason I asked about that is time is an interesting thing. You know, I've been doing a lot of reading recently on 
know, different generals and different people from the Civil War and the 1800s and the Independence War. And mm-hmm. one thing that I've noticed is we're living today in a world, in a generation, in a society where we feel like everything is moving faster than ever. Mm-hmm. And it's not really. <laughs> we feel like things are more unstable than ever. And it's like grandfather was born in 1928 in Europe. Things have been unstable, you know, (laughs) in other lifetimes. And we think that it's more polarized than ever. And it's not. But, you know, for our generation, we just are in such a hurry all the time. We're in such a hurry. And to have two years recovery, to have two years sacrifice away from what you're trying to do. Mm. If I asked someone to take two years, the next two years of sacrifice to to get what they wanted, most people Mm. wouldn't spend two years doing it. And yet, you know, I'm finishing up uh, Ulysses S. Grant's book, his biography. And there were times where he spent three or four years just in the wilderness, depressed and building log cabins and almost bankrupt and he goes on to be the greatest general in the history of america and the president of the country no one who knew him at that time would have foreseen where he was going and so you spend two years out of action to get back into action and and it's like you're willing to do it because you have no other choice and yet so many of us won't spend two three four five eight ten whatever the sacrifice is going to be to have the rest of the life doing what we want Mm -hmm. and i just can't wrap my mind around that because Two years is a lot, but as you said, it kind of flew by because each step was intentional. And if you're intentional with what you want and you know what you want and you're willing to work for it, two years is nothing, right? No, it's not. And and I read several critical books during this process. One was Mm. uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, who Mm. has some compelling case studies in there. And that boils down to the number 10,000, like 10,000 hours is what it takes of purposeful practice to enter into the realm of, of elite or great or being really, really good at something. And for most people, that will take a decade, right? If it's a passion project, if it's a side hustle, you know, 20 hours a week, like there's your 10,000. So I had that number kind of in my head, right? Because I looked at this as, yeah, I'm coming at this from someone who's got a decent amount of experience as a Green Beret, but this is a new venture for me because now I'm doing it as a one-legged guy and I don't have many people to learn from. So I want to say I put myself at scratch, but I said, okay, like this is going to be a journey. No clue how long it's going to take. But to your point is I think a lot of people overestimate what they can do in a year and they underestimate what they can do in a day. And I don't think that that's just accidental or coincidental or a bump of stick, a slogan. It's like, we can accomplish so much in 24 hours, you know, so much. And when you begin to, you know, look at your time as a currency, as a way to maybe frame it. And if you cut out that white space, like time on the day, on the calendar, on the 24, that is just floating and you get that much more precise, followed up with the execution, man, you can accomplish a lot in one day. And you maximize that, you know, Gladwell's, 10,000 can start to shrink pretty quick, or at least the time it can take to get to 10,000 can start to shrink pretty quick. So, you know, at the time of my recovery and going through this and being just balls to the wall and insane, every minute mattered. Every minute, Matt, I needed to maximize every possible minute. And, you know, this is an option for anybody. Of course, I would just leave this by saying, the size of the struggle is going to be commensurate with the size of the goal. And if you believe that and you choose to accept that, the size, they're equal. So the big dreams, big struggle, like small goal, like small struggle, like those two, those two things are in line with each other. Not only is that what I would argue is to be accurate, but also the adversity, the challenges, the setbacks, the failures, these are indicators that you are on a path of righteousness and something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And if we can see it that way, we begin to appreciate all this stuff. So whether you're talking about how to dissect 24 hours in a day, or this thing came out of left field and it totally sucks. Like, all right, cool. Like this is the game. It's in that moment that this is the game and you get that one victory. It builds momentum. You get another one, you get another one, you begin hunting it. And now you become, you know, a lethal 
asset capable of literally anything you can set your mind to. And earlier you talked about the fact that being a father, being a husband is potentially the hardest thing that you've ever done. How did you manage? Because there are times where I've gotten so focused and so determined and so aggressive. I have literally surprised the hell out of myself. Mm. There have been times where I get so focused, so determined, so aggressive in three or four weeks, so much change has taken place in my life. Uh, you know, specifically like if I'm again on a cut or a weight loss or business development or big swings with things, when you just do one thing with all of you, mm. it is crazy. <laughs> yeah. It is yeah. like I have videos of me from a few years ago. I'm like, can you believe I just did this in three weeks? In three weeks. Yeah. But it came at a huge sacrifice to my kids and to my wife and to my home life. Mm. And I became so um uh, aggressive. I became so aggressive in all areas of my life. I loved it. Mm. It was like unlocking this like ridiculous version of me where I'm like, I love it. And everyone hated being around me. <laughs> mm. yeah. I turned into such an asshole. So how do you go through the ups and the downs and fight off the depression and the sadness and the woe is me and all this stuff and have the determination and lock in your like every minute needs to count. And you know, your spouse, your kids, your family, are they just like, well, that's what makes you so awesome and they love it about you or how do you balance that? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I fully recognize that, you know, the time that I was going through my road back to the team, I wasn't married to my wife and I was, we didn't have kids. So like, okay, it, it was me. And you know what? I, I got out of the hospital and I moved in with my now wife and we were at the very beginning of our relationship, but I knew it was real. I knew it was real. I could see the white picket fence and the kids and the dogs and the stuff. I knew it was there. I was home from the hospital maybe two weeks and I had developed my plan, you know, minute to minute and said, this is what I'm going to do. And I sat her down and I said, Hey babe, um, here's the situation. I'm going all in on this. Okay. And that's, I don't have a choice. I'm not giving myself an option. This is what I'm doing. I'm truly burning the boats on this thing. This is what my life will look like. And what this means for us is there will be no dinners. There will be no weddings. If someone dies, I'm not going. When I say all in, I mean, literally all in. And you know what? I understand if you don't want to be a part of this journey with me. I went into that conversation, Mark, fully expecting her to be like, dude, you are like, your mind. I'm out of here. <laughs> but I was willing to sacrifice that. I was that obsessed. I was willing to sacrifice that. And you could say, yeah, you guys just started dating, which is true. But yeah. I knew that there's some, something real was there. Yeah. I was willing at that time of my life to give up everything else for this one thing. Fast forward now, coming up on a decade, actually, in a few days, it'll, it'll be the 10-year mark of when I was wounded. My life's different now. There is no professional goal that I'd be willing to sacrifice my family for. So huh. it absolutely makes things more complicated and more challenging when you have a family in the game, spouse, kids, et cetera. So you use the word balance and, you know, it's a word that I have a, a love hate relationship with, but what I will say is that those of us that prioritize our families, which I would hope is most of us that have them is with the same level of tenacity and dedication and aggression in which we attack our professional and our personal ambitions and goals, we attack our families the exact same way. And yeah. the same mechanisms we use to be successful within business or within whatever else is, we can apply those to our, to our family lives. And yet the white space will have to almost certainly disappear entirely if you want to do at least halfway decent job of both of those things, because there is a give and take. And yes, the person out there, single, no kids, Nick Lavery, like thousand miles an hour, you're not going to be able to outpace that individual, right? You can't. There's only 24 hours in a day. And that other person that's actually going all in 18, 20 hours a day towards the same thing you want, eventually they will catch up or supersede you, right? So yeah. like, what is happiness to you? What is success to you? Is your family part of that process? then yes. And my wife put this great to me at one point, because it's now not only am I an active duty Green Beret, but I also am a small business owner, building a brand and doing stuff outside of the uniform. And I've been attacking these things the way that I do. She sat me down at one point, which is something I know you're going to appreciate. And she said, Hey, babe, listen, 
I know your intentions. I know your integrity. I know that every minute of this day is spent towards something of worthwhileness and something of value. And you're not playing video games. You're not gambling. You're not like, I know that about you. I know the what that you are doing is positive and good for you and us in the world. But if you build this empire, if you build this legacy, if you build this enterprise and you're at the top of the possible precipice of your industry and in the process, you've lost those that you love the most, is it going to matter? And I said, yeah. shit, you know what? <laughs> you're absolutely right. So yeah, it's an individual uh, question, man. And uh, it's difficult. And I'll just sit here with the balance thing. When we do not have the luxury of quantity, particularly talking about time, we then have the obligation to increase the quality. Quality. And that doesn't mean trips to Disney World. Doesn't have to be expensive, extravagant. Quality to me means that you are authentically in that moment, in that time, right? Mm -hmm. When you're on the floor playing Legos, you're all in on Legos, bro. I'm going to build the greatest <laughs> Lego tower in history. I'm not thinking about email. This fort that me and my kids are building right now is going to be the best. This thing's going to be combat ready in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> you're right. digging in, you're setting up pikes and everything. The whole thing, like sharpening right? Sandbags, sticks. overhead cover. I'm not thinking about emails or Instagram or unless there is a scud missile heading towards my house, I don't care what's going on at work. But you know what, man? That's a skill and you really have to be deliberate about it. And it's a skill that I have a lot of work still to do because I have a lot of professional and personal ambitions. So yeah. just that focus, man, which we talked about once already, applying so, that so in that moment is critical. Yeah, it's so interesting to me because I think people want to build stuff with balance. And I honestly, if, there's a few things that I hesitate to say aloud, but I honestly think that anyone who's satisfied can't build something great because th there's this constant feeling of being unsatisfied that helps keep pushing and keeps help growing yeah. and going to the next level. And so I worry about comfort. I worry about being satisfied. I worry about balance, not because I think that I want more of it. I think it keeps us from those big dreams and that greatness we have. But I, I, I also know that it's no way to live. If you want to do something remarkable, you have to go all in on it. And so if I go back to when I was building my agency, 16 years ago, for many, many years, everyone knew, I wouldn't say it out loud, but everyone knew that for me, it was business, wife, kids. And they knew that because if a client call came up while I was on vacation, I would take it. Mm. You know, if I had to get up from dinner, even if friends were over and say, excuse me, sorry, something's happening right now, blowing up at work, I would go and do that. And so I didn't have to tell anyone that was my priority, but it was. Mm. Now, could I have built the business I built without doing that? I actually don't think so. Mm. I think if you wanted to recover and through your recovery, and you also had to worry about what your cousins and your mom thought and what this neighbor thought and what this other thing was happening and go off to the birthday party and go do all that stuff, you, like, no. you would have been like, no, I couldn't have done it. I need to do this now so that way I can have the foundation to then build upon it. Mm -hmm. And so that's... I think the uncomfortable truth that in, that we all kind of want to dance around. Now, my wife sat me down, maybe similar to yours, and a media agency. And we've been working for years to get a television show. This is like in 2007, 2008. I've worked for these 12 weeks every single summer. I would travel. I would go away. I'd be gone. I'd be working to the middle of the night. It, was, it took me two years mm. of work to get this TV show. And I've, having spent two full summers traveling and away and not with my kids and not with my wife. Guess what? We get the call. We got a contract with a national broadcast to do a TV show. Mm -hmm. We got the contract. And I turn to my wife and I say, we, we just worked for two years for this. I say, we, we just mm -hmm. worked for two years mm -hmm. for this, my wife. And she goes, I don't want you to do this. She wow. goes, I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to spend another summer away. No, the last two years have been hell. Yeah. And I said, we just worked for so hard to get this. Yeah, she's, she's, yeah this we is did. She said, this is what she said. Listen, Mark, I'm not going to be the type of wife to tell you that you can't go off and do this, but I hope you, you're the type of husband who knows that you shouldn't. Mm. And I was like, oh my <sighs> goodness, that is well painful. Yeah. <laughs> and my wife does not think she's a woman of words, but that was like, and I had to say no. And everyone looked at me and everyone said, you saying no to this? Con the person I had gotten the contract with, I had to turn everything away and I'd say, I had to do this for my wife and family. And you know what? 
it was, I wouldn't say it was the greatest decision, but it made me realize that, you know what, that contract was just ego. It wasn't really going to help us that much. It was a bit of a distraction, frankly. And I needed to prove at that moment to my wife and my kids that they were more important than this other thing that frankly, Mm. so I would have got a TV contract, whatever. Right. And so I struggle because I don't think we can balance, but I think we need to know when we're sacrificing too much. That's great. There's so much there. I mean, one, I, I, you bring up the word satisfaction, and I think remaining unsatisfied is essential. Remaining unsatisfied. Satisfaction and happiness are two different things. You know, mm-hmm. like the one two punch is waking up every day happy yet unsatisfied. And I can, I get a lot of pushback with times like that, man. Like, you're not satisfied in your marriage? I said, no, man. Mm-hmm. I am extremely happily married. But I'm unsatisfied with my performance as a husband. I want to be a better husband. I'm unsatisfied with me as a father. I want to be a better father. Like I want to be better at everything about me all what the time. What do you need to work on? Oh, man. Um, patience, communication, <laughs> focus, being in the moment. There's certainly a long list <laughs> for sure. But uh, balance is, and that's why I said I have a love hate relationship with that. People tend to look at balance like the goal is to get this teeter totter absolutely flat and just keep it there all the time. Not only would I argue that's impossible, but particularly if you've set your sights on some large ambitions and some large dreams, which I mean, shit, man, like this isn't a dress rehearsal. Why would you not do that? This is a gift. Like you got one shot at this thing, like go big, leave it all in the field. If you do set your sights on that and you actually want to make a run at it for real, you're going to have to be wildly unmotherfucking balanced for a decent amount of time. Can't put a number on it. Can't put a scale on it. But if you're talking about, I want to play in the NFL, I want to build a fortune 50 company and whatever it is, you are required for you to be unbalanced for a decent period of time for some matter. And those other priorities within your life, they're going, it's going to come at a cost to that. So I don't think there's a wrong answer. And you mentioned this already, Mark. I just strive for people to have an understanding as to what they're sacrificing and what are the costs associated and what's the gain associated with that. And then make up your decision. Like mm-hmm. just sit down and ask yourself, what are my priorities? Because we all have them. In the military, we have an expression, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. Like something is going to be number one and something's going to be number 700. It's a list. And that may move and shift over time, but just knowing what that is can at least help us determine how far in am I willing to go towards this thing, really? So as someone who's living with a disability, I think it would be hard to imagine. There's this great book. Oh, gosh, I remember. I wish I remembered the author of it, but it's about happiness. And it was written in 2003 or 2004. And the author talks about the fact that there's this conjoined twins, these people who are Siamese twins, I think is the old term that they used to use. Mm -hmm. But that anyone who was born without a twin would look at this conjoined twins and think they could not possibly be happy. I mean, what quality of life do they have? And yet, if you ask the conjoined twins if they were happy, they would say, of course, we're happy. Because us, you know, non-conjoined twin people can't imagine being in that situation and finding happiness. But we discount the fact that, that this, these conjoined twins have a life partner, that they have someone who they mm-hmm. share every single moment with. They like, we, we not only, we play up the setbacks and challenges and couldn't imagine being happy. And yet we totally ignore the benefits that might come from it. Mm. And so you have worked through recovery. You've earned your way back into the field. You've done what no one else has done to date. And so I would look at you and I would say, I can't imagine (laughs) that there are benefits from this. And yet at the same time, I've been in this industry enough to know, Mm. damn, there are probably a ton of positives that have come from this thing that you did not ask for. Um, Yeah. So, so walk us through if you can. I mean, what are some of the benefits aside from, frankly, me making a terrible joke like better parking? What would be some of the benefits from, from this? <laughs> well, I mean, there's the obvious support and service I'm able to provide those that are going through similar circumstance to me. Someone who lost a limb, 
but that extends way beyond that. You know, then like the next natural echelon is someone dealing with some kind of a physical injury. Oh, hey, how do I navigate through this? But then, you know, you get kind of more broad. It's like, you're really just talking about adversity. You're talking about a challenge or a series of challenges and physically, mentally, emotionally. And now I've just described every single human being walking on the face of the earth. So, you know, it's, it's wild, man, because <laughs> again, like I said, I'm a green beret and this is what I do. You know, and we live by this synonym known as the quiet professionals. And it's part of who we are and we people of action. And we let our results speak for themselves. I've had to re-examine or reinterpret my definition of that. And I've realized that there's a difference between being a quiet professional and a silent professional. And this is still something I struggle with to this day, even just being on this, having this conversation with you, man, you know, the Nick Lavery of 15 years ago would have never considered this whatsoever, right? Like I'm a warrior. I go places and do bad things to bad people. And I come back and no one ever needs to know about it. That was me. I've had to get past that. I've chosen to get past that. It's a better way to say it. And then the impact that that has created that has become contagious. That's become something that I have fallen in love with. Mm. And it ranges on the spectrum from, you know, thank you for your service and thank you for what you wrote in your book. And I learned something new and I applied it and all that is fantastic. And that's amazing. And it's humbling and it's awesome. I also, I got an email, you know, maybe a few months ago from a woman who's married to a Marine, former Marine who tried to kill himself. Fortunately, he failed at that. She stumbled upon a video, ordered my book, got it in front of him, hit me up to tell me that he's doing much better. You get an email like that, man, on like a Wednesday afternoon. Um, hmm. Still don't know how to quantify the impact that that has on me. So, yeah, I've lost the limb. I get the parking, right? There's a ton, there's a ton of struggles that come daily with this lifestyle that I now live. But what it has provided to at this point, hundreds of thousands of people. And now with the world being as small as it is, thanks to the internet and social media, I'm able to connect with these individuals. So for me personally, that's been quite impactful, but that impact comes at the hand of being able to assist others that are struggling or those that are striving to be better or looking for ways to, you know, achieve their dreams, man. So it's been a wild ride. Yeah but I feel very blessed to be here, to be able to provide that kind of support. I guess you didn't have a choice in it um, because you, I mean, you didn't chose your profession. You understood the risks of getting injured, but you didn't choose this injury. You didn't choose to give up. And when there's no choice, you just got to do it. I mean, you, you didn't choose to have your daily life be a little bit more challenging or maybe a little bit slower, whatever it is. You just got to get on with it and do it. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm kind of realizing now is when I give up on myself or my dreams or my goals, or I'm inconsistent or I'm not going to work hard or I'm not determined or whatever it is, I'm choosing to give up. Mm -hmm. But if I don't, if I don't make that choice, if I don't choose to give up, there is no choice. Like you just got to do what you got to do. That's it, man. Life doesn't cooperate. <laughs> it doesn't. It, life doesn't cooperate. We got an expression, another one in the military. It says, "No plan survives first contact," and that means when we say contact, <laughs> that means like we've made contact with the enemy. No plan survives first contact. And we talked about planning and strategy and methodologies, and we do this relentlessly. And then, you know, it's all going quote unquote according to plan. And then rounds start cracking off. And then the plan goes out the window because now you've got to yeah. adapt to the variable changes that are all happening around you in real time. Like that's life. It's, it's not going to cooperate. It's going it, to, you're going to get knocked off track. <laughs> Um, there's going to be roadblocks put in front of you that you weren't expecting, some that you were anticipating, some you weren't. What I've just chosen to believe, and because I've, I've seen the value in it, is when these things happen, these are opportunities. The problems are opportunities. And if most people allow that to stop them or give them the excuse to off ramp or just fall in the soft place that they were looking to land anyway. This right now, this one moment in time, this is the game. This is it. 
this is the chance to either extend your lead, make up the ground, or take some substantial steps towards what you're trying to do. Most Mm -hmm. will not. You have the option now to see this as your chance to accelerate and to advance and to progress. You start reframing challenges and adversity through that one little switch, through that different lens. You know, I fell down, I sprained my ankle. Immediately, you're like, shit, you think of all the bad, I'm not going to do this, I can't play basketball anymore, I'm going to mm-hmm. need to be on a crutches, it's going to suck, it's negative, 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 negative. Or you can be like, oh, you know what? Now I got a chance to make my left leg super strong. Now I got a chance to make my up. I don't have to worry about leg day. I don't have to worry about leg day for at least another six weeks. It's upper body only every day. This is going to be awesome. And people hear that and they're like, yeah, it's like ridiculous. It's like, no, it's not ridiculous. Like that is the exact example of what I'm talking about. You take something that would most people would be like, this is horrible. My life's over, whatever it is and say, all right, Roger that. How can I leverage this? And you do that again and again and again and again. Then, Mark, I bet you've read as much as I have, if not more. There are certainly some consistencies with people that we look up and emulate and people that have reached success, whatever definition that is to you. And that right there is embedded within at least 99% of them. Just keep going, man. Right? Just keep going. You hurt your leg. Okay. Put, put the effort to work somewhere else. Make something else stronger. Just, just change. Roger that. Move. Roger that. Move. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, man, Nick, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I have one more question for you. Before I do, yeah, how can people connect with you? Where, where should they go? Easiest spot is our website. It's machinenick.com. It's got links to all the socials, email that can, goes directly to me, merch, book, all the stuff. Okay. Okay, we will we will get that linked up for sure. So be sure to check Nick out, check out the book, check out everything he's doing online. Okay, final question for you. Yes, sir. When you are really in the thick of it, think of that, think of the hardest moment in training, think of the hardest moment in recovery, think of when shit is going sideways in the battlefield. Mm. What is it that you tell yourself? This is the cost of admission. Mm. That's the first phrase. This is the cost. You want to be a Green Beret. You want to be an amputee athlete. You want to be a small business owner. You want to build a brand. You want to leave a legacy. You want to be a great dad. You want to be a great husband. This is the challenge. This is the cost of admission. This is what it takes. This is what it takes. 